Well, welcome back to Sunday School Monday. I'm going to be recording in my office because we have canceled church for tomorrow because of the big uh, snow apocalypse that's supposedly on its way. We'll see. Bring it on. Our lesson today is entitled Values. And it's taken from several different places in Scripture. So if you're following along, you're going to kind of jump a little bit. It's taken from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16, verses 20 through 21, and Ezekiel chapter 23, verses 36 through 39, and Psalms 139, 13 through 16. So let's take a look at the printed text, see what God has to say to us, and come back and talk about it. Beginning with Ezekiel 16 at verse 20. Moreover, thou hast taken thy sons and thy daughters, whom thou hast borne unto me, and these hast thou sacrificed unto them to be devoured. Is this of thy whoredoms a small matter? That thou hast slain my children and delivered them to cause them to pass through the fire for them. Then go to Ezekiel 23, starting at verse 36. The Lord said, Moreover unto me, Son of man, wilt thou judge Ahola? And Aholabah, yea, declare unto them their abominations, that they have committed adultery, and blood is in their hands, and with their idols have they committed adultery, and have also caused their sons, whom they bear unto me, to pass for them through the fire, to devour them. <coughs> Moreover, this they have done unto me. They have defiled my sanctuary in the same day and have profaned my Sabbath. For when they had slain their children to their idols, then they came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, thus have they done in the midst of mine house. Then over to Psalms. 139, beginning at verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for another opportunity to proclaim your word. I pray, Lord, that you would speak through me the words you want spoken, that you would touch hearts, that you would meet needs, whatever might be present, that you would convict sin, that you would just comfort those that are sad, touch those that are sick and lift them up. Give direction, Father. Give us wisdom. Help us to make wise, godly decisions. I just pray that you would speak to us through these, your words, and we give you praise for it in Jesus' name, and amen. Okay, again, the, the lesson is entitled Values. So we're going to be starting with chapter 16 of Ezekiel, and he kind of starts off, you know, he describes God's grace to unfaithful Jerusalem. Now, when we pick up, he's going to start talking about some of the ugly things that they've done. But God is always extending his grace. And he still does that today to you and I. Praise God for that. And then Ezekiel 23 described God's judgment 
against Samaria and Jerusalem, the capitals of Israel and Judah. He uses two sisters in his analogy. And then David reflected on God's awesome power in Psalm 139. All right, so let's start off here with Ezekiel 16, verses 20 and 21. Moreover, thou hast taken thy sons and thy daughters, whom thou hast borne unto me, and these hast thou sacrificed unto them to be devoured. Well, this is really getting into God describing how low Israel has sank. They are taking up the gods of the peoples around them, and they're adapting to some of their worship techniques, which involved sacrificing their children to the god Molech. And they did this through the burning of them, through fire. Now, we go back to when child sacrifices were performed, and I think that's going on today in the form of abortion. The child is being sacrificed for the convenience of the parents. Now, folks, that's a very touchy subject. I realize that, that a lot of people are pro-abortion, my body, my choice. But no, it's not. We're going to talk about some statistics in a minute about how fast a child develops, how fast it becomes a living, breathing human being. So, I'm sorry if I step on your toes, but that's the way that I believe. Life begins at conception. And to me, there's no debate about that. We have the technology now to know it, to see it, to understand it. And when we perform abortion, it's murder, pure and simple. Now, the Lord vividly describes the people's wicked use of their own children in pagan sacrifices. He says, Thy sons and thy daughters, whom thou hast born unto me. God is the one that performs the bringing about of life. Through the miracle of birth, through the way God has worked this out, through the conception and how the sperm comes to the egg, fertilizes it, and then a life is developed. It's a miracle. I can't explain how that works. It takes somebody bigger than me to make that happen. That's God. But he describes these children as his own. They're his children. He produces them. He makes them. They're his children. We as parents have the care for those children, but they belong to God. So we're taking something that belongs to God and destroying it. They were doing it back then. We're still doing it today. It says that they sacrificed unto them to be devoured. Now, when you think about that, back in this day and time, a lot of these pagan gods, they would have images made of them and they would have them there on their little places where they put them. And they would lay food or gifts in front of these gods to present to them. And this is the picture of what it's saying here. They sacrificed their children unto these pagan gods to be devoured. So it, it, it's like they're feeding their children to these gods after they've passed them through the fire. It's just absolutely horrendous what was going on back in this day and time. And then God says, Is this of thy whoredoms a small matter? God is showing his displeasure in a great way. This is not a small matter. This is a horrendous, horrible matter of what they're doing in killing their children. God rebuked them for taking his gifts and using them to worship idols. Do you think about that? They're taking the gifts of God to them and using them to worship idols. They themselves had engaged in illicit sexual activity as worship rites. All those things were bad enough, but then they went even as far as to offer their own children as sacrifices. It's an abomination. 
Thou hast slain my children, reaffirmed that children belong to God. Thou hast slain my children. They belong to me, and you have destroyed them. Parents did not have the right to determine when their children's lives ended. That's for God, not for parents to determine. To cause them to pass through the fire constitutes an allusion to human sacrifice. The parents dedicated themselves and their children to the image of the gods they served by ending their children's lives. Many people today do not value children. God does. We will be better people when we raise or when we take care of those things that God values, such as children. All right, let's go on over to Ezekiel 23 at verse 36. The Lord said, Moreover unto me, Son of man, wilt thou judge Ahola and Aholaba? Yea, declare unto them their abominations. Well, the question to Ezekiel, wilt thou judge Ahola and Aholaba, was essentially a command for Ezekiel to do just that, to judge them. All right, so Ahola and Aholaba, which were sisters, represented Samaria and Jerusalem the capitals of the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of, Ju of Judah. Well, the northern kingdom had sinned against the Lord, the Lord and its sin eventually resulted in exile. And then the southern kingdom saw all the wickedness of the northern kingdom but grew worse than the northern kingdom. So basically, the analogy with these two sisters and one of them was really being bad and then she was de destroyed, she was judged well, you would think that her sister would look and see what had happened to her and change her ways, but no, she went even further being bad. Thus saying, this is what went on with Samaria and Jerusalem. You know, Samaria came in and, and or Jerusalem came in and was destroyed, and uh, or Samaria was, and then Jerusalem went even as bad as they could, and, and so then they came in and it was just even worse what they did. So this is what God is telling Ezekiel to do, and he's using the names of these two sisters, but it was really representing Samaria and Jerusalem. So he said, declare unto them their abominations. Well, this word abomination refers to grievous sins of various kinds, but essentially it refers to the sin of, idolat of uh, idolatry being with sexual immorality. And that's kind of what it's alluding to. Well, then in verse 37, it says that they have committed adultery and blood is in their hands and with their idols have they committed adultery and have also caused their sons whom they bear to me to pass for them through the fire to devour them. Okay, so here in verse 37, <coughs> God lists four sins. First, he said they have committed adultery, sin number one. Second, he affirmed that blood is in their hands. Now, this bloodshed here designates murder of the helpless, their children. Third, with their idols, they have committed adultery. Well, spiritual adultery occurred as the people forsook the Lord to worship Baal and other gods. They committed sexual adultery. They did that too in some of their practices but they also committed spiritual adultery when they took false gods as opposed to the one and true only God. And then fourth, they caused their sons whom they bear unto me to pass for them through the fire. God absolutely hated these sins. And he's calling them out. Ezekiel, call them out. As God's people's sinned against him in smaller ways, they gradually became calloused and sinned in greater ways. Now, folks, that's the same thing that can happen to you and I. When we commit small sins, God will convict us. If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit living inside of you will check you and say, you messed up. At that point in time, God, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And it says God will forgive you. But when we don't ask for forgiveness, we become calloused. 
And when we become calloused and we don't feel the convicting power, then we elevate our sin category into much larger, much heinous sins. So basically here, we got to make sure we keep ourselves in check. And when we do mess up and sin, which we will, we're human, we ask for God to forgive us. Then he comes on down and he said, This they have done unto me remind us that all sin is first sin against God. Every sin we commit, first we're sinning against God, and then it could be against the other person or whatever. But first, it's always against God and his holy character. All right. They have defiled my sanctuary in the same day. Well, this is not saying that they go out and they kill their children and then they go to church. But what it's the analogy or the reference is, they go to church while they're still practicing these types of sins. They're still involved in this gross, hideous uh, sin of child sacrifice. So the people thought they became holy if they merely entered the temple area. How many people in this day and time Go to church Christmas and Easter. I'm good. It makes me holy when I go in there. No, it doesn't. What makes you holy is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Your relationship with God through Christ, when you accept him, God sees the holiness of Christ when he looks at you. You have no holiness. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. But when you accept Christ... He sees Christ's righteousness, which is perfect. Going to church doesn't do it. Getting baptized doesn't do it. Uh, praying doesn't do it. The only thing it does it is a relationship with Christ, and that's through the act of salvation, where you come to a point in your life when you say, I realize I'm lost, I'm a sinner, and I'm headed to a devil's hell, and I don't want to do that. Therefore, I cry out to God and accept his finished plan of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, and I confess my sins. Yes, I'm guilty, but I claim mercy <coughs> through Christ, and God will save you. It's simple. We, we sometimes trip over it because we want to have a part in it. Christ did it all. All we have to do is accept it with our heart. We have to understand what he did, believe it, and then when we accept that, Christ sends the Holy Spirit to dwell in us, which helps us live a godly life. And we basically have given ourselves to him. All right, God's declaration that the people profaned my Sabbaths charged that they were not honoring the day as God had commanded. You know, <clears throat> a lot of these people, they couldn't wait for the Sabbath to get over so they could go back to cheating their fellow man in their business dealings. It became a burden. It was something they did through rituals. They only went because that's what they were supposed to do. They weren't there worshiping God. They were there just doing it to get their obligation out of the way. And a lot of times that happens today. People go to church as an obligation. It needs to stop being an obligation and become an inspiration. I think Jack Hiles preached a sermon on that one time, talking about when it you know has to stop being an obligation and become an instigation or inspiration. So he's wanting people to, when they go into the temple and they honor the Sabbath, which today we use the first day of the week, the Sunday, to honor God, that we do it in a worshipful experience. It'll mean a lot more. Okay. They devalued their children and worshiped false gods because they said they had slain their children to their idols. There was no value in their children anymore. They just gave them up, killed them, and gave them to these false idols. Same thing today. They give them up through abortion. They kill them because they don't have any value for them. They don't see them as value. It's a mistake. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, I wish that hadn't happened. Oh, I'll just kill them. America's being judged for that. I pray that Roe v. Wade is overturned. We've got a good chance for that. That is my prayer. God said, they came into my sanctuary to profane it. At the same time, they were participating in their pagan rituals. He was not pleased. He was very upset. 
Little sins lead to bigger sins, and people's consciousness become dull as they live however they please. That's why we need the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and direction in how to lead our lives, how to live our lives. That's one of my prayers all the time every night. You know, God, give me wisdom and give me direction. I need to know what you want me to do. Help me to know that. Okay, let's go down to Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. All right. David reflected on his growth inside of his mother's womb, where it says, Thou hast possessed my reins. Well, the Hebrew word translated reins can refer to the kidneys. Yep, kidneys. You know why? Because kidneys in the Hebrew mindset sometimes designated the place of emotion and affection within the body. They thought it was in the kidneys. So that's why it's talking about the reins here. Thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast possessed my affection and, and my emotions. And he said, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Well, that word covered me translates to God's perfect care for David's unformed body. Let me read that again. The word translated covered me stresses God's perfect care for David's unformed body. Yet David was a person. His body just wasn't formed yet. Same thing that happens at conception. A life begins at the moment of conception. Yeah, you don't have all the things formed right, but the life is there, and God knows who that person is. God sees everything about that person. That's what David's going on down. He's amazed. He's staggered at the idea of how God does all of this. It says that abortion is wrong because it interrupts the creation process. The process that begins at conception. It devalues the life that God has created. But David goes on to say that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, that word translated fearfully contains the idea of awe and wonder. Then the word translated wonderfully, because it says I am fearfully and wonderfully made, so fearfully is awe and wonder. Well, wonderfully comes from a verb that means to be surpassing or extraordinary and describes God's mighty works. Okay, the word works can denote a variety of God's creative acts, but here in this instance, it highlights, highlights his creation of life in the womb. God is busy building that child. In the womb. It's just amazing how God can create a life. We can't just devalue that life and decide to end it because it's inconvenient. That's a slap in God's face. Now, let me stop right here. <coughs> a lot of people that are now Christians have had abortions. A lot of people that are not Christians have had abortions. God can forgive you of anything and everything. The only thing God can't forgive you of is what you don't ask. So you're sitting maybe thinking, I've had an abortion. God can never forgive me. Yes, he can. And he could be convicting you right now. Cry out to him. Tell him you're sorry and ask him to save you. He's a mighty God. He can do that and he will. All right, let's go down to the last two verses, 15 and 16. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Let's stop right there and just talk about this a minute. Curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Well, let's go back up here to this word wrought, W-R-O-U-G-H-T. 
It occurs elsewhere in Scripture where it describes the weaving of the multicolored cloth for the tabernacle. So somebody had to weave this beautiful cloth that was used in the tabernacle, and it was very beautiful, and that's the picture of God weaving together, making this child. It's precious. It's precious. It's God's creative handiwork in the womb. Then it says, in the lowest parts of the earth. Now, that's a strange thing to say, that I was created or wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Well, David used it in a figurative sense to describe the womb's dark and hidden interior. As we come on down, it says, at conception, the foundation of a child's physical characteristics intelligence, and personality are established. At conception, from the get-go, after only 21 days, the baby's heart beats regularly. And the foundation of the brain, spinal cord, nervous systems already are established. After 35 days, fingers can be discerned on the baby's hands. At 40 days, brain waves appear. At three months, hair begins to grow on the baby's head. And then at five months, the baby weighs about a pound and is about 12 inches long and responds to loud, startling noises. There are some of the progression that we can now understand through technology. It's a living creature, a human being a baby. It's not a mass of tissue. It's a baby. Okay. In verse 16, it says, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. David focused on God's plan for his life before he was even born. God had a plan. Now you think about that. If God had a plan for David, does he not have a plan for you and me and everybody else? And then when you take it on down the line, he had a plan for all of those aborted babies as well. And we'll never know that plan. Those plans were stopped at man's hands. When David was still taking on the shape and form he would have when he was born, God already saw him and knew him because he knew what he was going to be. God sees it as it's done, and it's a living person. God already saw David's life as a completed work. He knew what David would do. He knew that he would slay that giant, Goliath. He knew that he would be king. He'd be Israel's greatest king. He knew he would sin. He would do things that, you know, he was ashamed of. He would have to be called out. He was human. You know, you look at that and you say, well, how come God would even put it in the Bible about David, you know, killing Uriah and, and having adultery with his wife and all this stuff? Because that's what happens. And that still happens today. God's people are still overtaken in faults. God will forgive if we confess those sins. We're human. We are susceptible to sin in a great way. That's why we need to pray and be on guard against it on, as, on a continuous basis. Because Satan's, anybody that's on fire for God and trying to do good, <coughs> Satan wants to stop it. And one of the best ways to stop a great work is to destroy the reputation of that individual. We have to protect our reputations. We need to abstain from all appearance of evil. All right, David goes on and says, In thy books, in thy book, all my members were written. God already knew David's life as a completed work. David's days were when as yet there was none of them, but yet God saw them. God saw David's life and purpose from beginning to end before David was ever born. Now, folks, 
This is a great lesson from Ezekiel on God's mercy, God's grace, and what God's plans are for each of us. None of us are perfect. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, but God is faithful and just and has to punish sin. But yet, God has made a provision for you and I to have our sins forgiven because of a sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice. That was Jesus Christ. He died for everybody. None are excluded. Everybody he died for. Now, that does not mean everybody's going to be saved. You have to ask. He's not going to intrude upon you. You have to ask. You have a free will. You can choose whether you want to serve him or you don't. That's your two options. You either serve him or you don't serve him. You either saved or you're lost. You either spend eternity in heaven or you spend eternity in a devil's hell, which was created for him and his angels. You'd be going there as an intruder. But without Christ, that's where you'll go. When God gave the Ten Commandments, it showed us who God was and what God expects. As Paul stated, they were basically a schoolmaster to teach us that we could never fulfill what God wanted to be classified as holy. Now, God wasn't caught off guard by that. This was part of God's plan. And that's why Jesus came, lived a sinless life. He was crucified. He died. He was buried. And yet, after three days, he resurrected. And then he walked around on earth so people could see him and see that he had come back to life. And then he went back on up to heaven to be with God, to sit on his right hand, to make intercession for you and I, Christians. Folks, it's a beautiful, beautiful story. And it's for everybody. And I would suggest, if you've never asked Christ to come into your life and to save you, that you do that today. You have no guarantee of tomorrow. I pray that you'll do that. God loves you, and so do I. See you next week.